How are we doing? I'm here to start off this morning with that question. How, how are you doing? Because I know... a little bit as we get into our series on emotions. And I told you last week we're going to start off with some of the lesser favorite emotions. And I don't know many people who like the emotion of hate. Does anybody like hating something? Does anybody enjoy that feeling that you feel when you feel hatred towards something? I don't know of many of us who do. In fact, if you do, I guess we'll have to talk later because we'll just need to talk later. But as we go through this emotion of hate and hatred, I want to ask us three questions this morning. Talk about three different questions. First, we'll try to define what is hate. What is hate or what is hatred? What does God hate or what does it mean for God to hate? Can God even hate? Is that possible for a for a, a deity described as a god of love to be described as hateful. And finally, what does that mean for us? What does God's hate mean for us? What does our hatred mean for us? When we're feeling anger over this hatred or we're feeling the emotion of hate, how should we feel in that? And what does that mean for us? So let's get into that first question of what is hate and how do we define it? And as I was thinking this week and getting into this, I struggled this week with this whole lesson on hatred and the hatred of God and what hatred means. Because every single definition I looked up didn't seem to do this emotion, didn't seem to do this feeling justice. It didn't seem like there was enough. Because how many of you have heard this, this phrase before that hatred is a strong word? Or hate is a strong word. I think we've all heard that before while growing up. Especially as little siblings and we tell one of our other little siblings that we hate them and then you hear a grandparent or a parent say, now that's a strong word. We don't don't like to use that word, do we? But what is hate? And so I got this definition and this seemed to do the best job of simplifying it, of boiling it down into three basic points. Intense hostility and aversion deriving from fear anger, or sense of injury. Intense hostility and aversion deriving from fear, anger, or sense of injury. This goes into that whole flight or fight response. Fight or flight response. And there's a third one that's flight, fright, or flight, fight, or freeze. So those people who who come to a crossroads and come to a decision making and they freeze up and decide not to do anything at all, that is that third response of freeze there. But oftentimes we get to this flight or fight response because of situations that cause fear, situations that cause us anger, or situations we perceive that will cause us injury or harm, or worst of all, possibly death. We often hear this, this phrase of, it's often tied in with things that we, we fear. If I said, I hate the dark, Does that mean I'm going to physically fight the dark? No, you can't physically fight the dark, but it does mean that I'll run up the stairs out of the basement after turning the light switch off a little bit quicker than I would normally, wouldn't it? It's that aversion. It's that flight response. Or if I say I hate bullies, I think often many of us can agree that we hate the act of bullying. Does it mean we hate individual people? Well, it can lead to that but we hate that action that's being performed. We hate that because it brings up anger. And what is anger then? Often anger comes from a a sense of an injustice. Oftentimes we call Harper our, our passionate one because she gets angry when somebody's not following the rules because there's an injustice that occurred. That's where her anger comes from, or I'm sorry, her passion comes from. Oftentimes, we hate actions because we see an injustice or an act against what we consider to be moral. How many people would say that they hate flying? 
or hate driving long distances, or, or hate heights, or hate spiders, or hate snakes. Now, why we call that hatred, that hatred is rooted in fear. We hate flying because we fear flying. We hate heights because we fear heights. Now, I wouldn't say that we hate heights or that we hate flying. It's more so that we hate the opposite result of not flying when supposed to be flying. And not necessarily hate the heights, but we hate the end result of falling from those heights. Hate comes from fear. That fear comes from a perceived notion of injury, danger, or death. It's not that we hate these things, we just reject, we avoid all things so that they may result in harm or death to ourselves. It's a natural instinct to hate these things. Krista and I got into this interesting conversation of my hatred of snakes. Would I hate snakes as much if they had arms? Does Krista hate snakes because they have too many arms? Spiders, sorry. Does Krista hate spiders because they have too many arms? That makes a little bit more sense because... But then I pictured snakes with these really big biceps and it, it just made a whole other image in my mind and I think I got more scared of snakes than I did beforehand. But we avoid things. It's a natural instinct to avoid things that make us uncomfortable, that we perceive to be a danger to us. And so that's where this definition of, of hatred comes from. We hate things because we fear them. We hate things because they make, them, make us angry. Or we hate them simply to avoid injury or harm to ourselves as a natural instinct. But that doesn't seem like enough, does it? That seems too simple. That seems like, well, then because of this, we should hate things. Should we hate things, I guess, would be the next logical question in that series. Should we hate things? As people who follow a God of love, a God who is defined as love, should we as Christians then hate things? And we'll get into that, and we'll answer that in a little bit here. But what about the question, what does God hate? Does God hate? Have you thought about that? What does God hate? And why does he hate those things? And so I came up with a list here, and the verses that these are pulled from is, is there right beside it. God hates pride from Psalms 5.5. 5. God hates divorce, divorce from Malachi 2, verse 16. God hates wrongdoing from Isaiah 61.8. God hates violence from Psalm 11.5. God hates bloodshed from Ezekiel 35.6. God hates evil from Psalm 45.7. That evil from 45.7 is also listed in Psalm 5.5 5 and Psalm 11.5 as well. But then God hates wickedness, referenced from Amos 5.15. Now notice what is common about all of these things that God hates. The things that God hates, these are all references from the Old Testament. These are all references from the Old Testament. The reason we have these grouped together is because the Old Testament, mainly written in Hebrew, the word hate here is the Hebrew word sana. Now, not that big wooden box that you get into and try to relax in and then it's really hot and it smells weird, but sana as in the Hebrew word for hate. The Hebrew word for hatred then becomes sina. The first one being S-A-N-A, the second one being S-I-N-A-H. I don't think there's a coincidence in the fact that it starts with S-I-N. Now, that's a different story. I don't want to dig too much into that, but I thought it was interesting that these two words, how many times would you guess the word hatred appears within the Old Testament? Let's play that game. Would you say between 5 to 15 times that the word hatred is in the Old Testament? Anyone there? Let's say 20 to 40 times in the Old Testament. Okay. I'll say 50 to 100 times in the Old Testament. Let's go, let's go a little higher. Let's go 100 to 200. Anything higher than that? Anyone not playing at all? <laughs> But the word sana, meaning hatred, from Hebrew within the Old Testament, occurs 148 times. 
148 times throughout Scripture. Now, when we look at this word hate that is used throughout the Old Testament, the primary use of these words is to describe mankind's actions or feelings towards mankind. It's roughly 70 to 80% of this usage in that manner. However, when we look at the word as a descriptor for God, which happens pretty infrequently, it's less than 10% of the time, God's feelings of hatred, it is oftentimes used as humanity describing God's feelings towards humanity. Meaning it's not God saying that I hate this or I hate that or I hate these people. It is other people saying, well, God hates us or God hates them. There's very few incidences of God hating naturally. Now, if we look into the the New Testament, the word that we see here described as hatred, it happens far less often in the New Testament. Miseo, or M-I-S-E-O, Miseo, is used over 40 times in the New Testament. But once again, in this context, it's the same. That it's man hating man. It's not a deity. It's not God himself hating things. But we do get two instances. Two instances that I want to zoom in this morning and see really where these come from. And the first one described as God hates Esau. God hates Esau. Or if we remember Jacob's twin, or Jacob's brother, Esau. Esau being the older brother and Esau, or Jacob being the the younger brother. And when we read this, it doesn't seem quite right on why God would hate Esau. But let me look, open up to Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. I've always loved you, says the Lord. But you retort, really? How have you loved us? And the Lord replies, this is how I showed my love for you. I loved your ancestor Jacob, but I hated his brother Esau and devastated his hill country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert for jackals. Now that doesn't sound like a God of love, does it? And yet God says to Israel, says to his people, I have always loved you. And then the Israelites return almost in a laughing manner and say, really? How have you loved us? You've led us through a desert. You've led us enslaved and then led us through a desert. You wouldn't let us into the promised land for 40 years. You had this nation take us over. You had this nation take us over. You had this nation destroy our temple to you. How have you loved us? And the Lord replies, this is how I showed my love for you. I loved your ancestor, Jacob. But Esau, Esau, I hated. Now some translations will actually say, as this one does, says, I rejected Esau. But there are more translations that translate that as, I hate Esau. And as I was working on this, I I was thinking about this, love and hate, and this, this kind of spectrum that bounces back and forth. Is there... Is there fully hate 100% of the time or is there fully love 100% of the time? Can there be one without the other or is it this sliding scale of where it starts in this neutralness and then it goes to like and then, you know, that middle school phrase of, oh, well, you like like them and then, then you love them. Or is it this neutral scale and then dislike and then strongly dislike and then, and then hate? Is it a sliding spectrum or is it just like a light switch where one, one is always on or one is always off? Which one are we referring to and how does, this, how does this work? In fact, we talked a little bit about this this morning with the whole aspect of, of evil and, and good. And we, I know we can get into this, this topic of can there be good without evil? Would we understand good without evil? Would we understand love without evil? hate? Can these two things exist without the other? I won't ask the question of can there exist light without dark because then we'll get into a whole argument on on that aspect of things. But if there was no hatred, would we fully understand the concept of love then? But then if God says he loves Jacob, how can he hate 
Esau. And there's three, three possibilities to this, and we'll get into this a little bit. I don't want to jump my slide too much here. And so there's three aspects of this possible hatred. God's hatred could simply refer to God loving Esau less than he loves Jacob. This is much like that light switch illustration that I just used. Where God doesn't necessarily hate Esau, he just loves him less than he loves Jacob. If we go back to Genesis and look at the story of Jacob and Esau, we see that Jacob was the younger brother. He was favored both in blessing and inheritance and by the mother of the two. But this does not mean Esau was cursed. Esau was blessed. If we look throughout Esau's life, every accountable thing to consider. Yahweh choosing Jacob over Esau. This is where we get into that term of rejection and the fact that this translation says that, that Jacob I loved, but Esau I rejected. Hate is often referred to as, to show rejection or a detestable attitude towards something or someone. It says in Scripture that, that from the time of the birth that God would choose Jacob over Esau. Despite Esau being the oldest brother, once again we see in Scripture God flipping things on its head. That's kind of a show of, look, what I can do. If you believe in me, I can do things that you can't even imagine and go against the grain of things. And this is how Yahweh chose to show this, through choosing Jacob over Esau. The other option goes into this whole parallelism and, and symbolism of, the, of Scripture. Jacob, does anybody know what Jacob's name later became? Israel. Jacob would later become Israel. There's kind of this common theme throughout all of Scripture of once you show faith within Jesus or choose to follow Jesus, then you are changed, not only inside but through name as well. Abram becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. Jacob becomes Israel. New Testament example, Simon would then become Peter. Meaning once you put your trust into Jesus, once you begin to follow the ways of God, you're changed not only spiritually, emotionally, but physically as well. This also happens. If we look at, how many have you heard the, the term daughter Zion? Well, what is Zion? It doesn't seem like a, a physical place, but it was also another name for Jerusalem. Or it represents the entire nation of Israel. Or it represents the coming kingdom of God. How can this one thing be so many different things? It's a common, common use of language throughout all of Scripture that singular people become representations for a larger whole. And so Jacob, many times used throughout this, all of a sudden, how does the Lord's love for Israel, I've always loved you, says the Lord. I've showed my love for Israel through your ancestor, Jacob. Jacob represents all of Israel. And so therefore, Esau here may represent all of Edom. And so the Esau and the Jacob we're talking about here aren't just individual people, but they're entire nations, thousands of years separated. And so here we see that, that God's hate isn't necessarily a hate of specifically Esau, but of his descendants and the wickedness during this time. This is kind of the one that I kind of cling to and see as God's hate. God's hate isn't necessarily a hatred of, of curses. It's a rejection or a judgment upon those people who choose wickedness over choosing God. And so that brings us to our final question this morning. What does it mean for us? Where does hate fit into our lives? Or should hate fit into our lives? And of course, I shut that off again. There we go. 
our own hatred. Our own hatred. What does this mean? It means we should hate what God hates. Right? Hopefully that makes sense. We should hate what God hates. And let's go back to that list of things that God hates. We should hate pride. We should hate divorce. We should hate wrongdoing. We should hate violence. We should hate bloodshed. We should hate evil. We should hate wickedness. Now, you may say, Josh, well, I see examples of violence all throughout the Old Testament. I mean, I see violence in the New Testament of Jesus being sent to a cross. I see evil throughout all of it. But why is, why is that violence present? Why is that wrongdoing present? Why is that pride present? Because if we go all the way back to Genesis, we can trace pride as the original sin, as the very first sin. It should be a pretty simple concept that we should hate things that God hates. But let's look a little deeper into this. Proverbs 16 does a pretty good job of painting a picture of the things that God hates. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord, and a family. It's common in Hebrew literature and ancient writings to go from a list of six to a list of seven when this isn't a finite list. Meaning that this list includes other things that the author just didn't choose to put into there. So we see those six things extended into seven things because this isn't an exhaustive list. This isn't all the things that God God hates. But notice what the author does here in Proverbs. He starts with the eyes at the top of the head, then to the tongue, and then after the tongue to the hands, and then after the hands to the heart, and then after the heart to the feet. It starts at the top It shows you how evil takes hold of one area and spreads through What do all of these six, seven things have in common with this list? This list of six or seven things. The commonality between all of these is division. Is division. God doesn't just hate these things to hate these things. Notice when I talked about violence and bloodshed, what it says here in Proverbs 6 is that he hates hands that kill the innocent. When I say that God hates violence and hates bloodshed, he hates reckless violence and reckless bloodshed. Things under the sun. I go through Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 and say there And so all of these things that God says he hates, we see that there may even be a time for these as long as they come in a proper instance, in a proper time for God's glory and for God's will. These things because... Hating what God hates isn't enough. There's one more step we have to take. Hate. What hates God?
if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everything. sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciples. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Now we ask. Jesus says, if they cause division, if they come against me, if they pull you away from me, then you must reject them. You must avoid them. You must abhor and avoid them because they pull you away from me. This is what that means. That doesn't just mean go and hate your mom for no good reason. It doesn't mean hate your dad for no good reason. That doesn't mean hate your wife or your children, even on the days that they sometimes maybe deserve a little bit of rejection. I saw a post online. I won't mention who it was from, but it says, I love you more than I loved you yesterday. Yesterday you annoyed me. It does not just mean hate for the sake of hating. It means anything that pulls us away from God. Anything that goes against God. Whether it be person, whether it be circumstance, whether it be situation. Anything that hates God, we should hate as well. And that brings up the question of that fight or flight response. Oh, Van, come back up and we'll move into the time of invitation this morning. So does it mean we fight against everything that hates God? Do we fight against everything? Do we fight against that list of six and seven things? Or do we simply avoid those things? We have to be smart and pick and choose our battles. We can't fight all those things. We can't fight the world's pride. We can't fight against all the divorce in the world, that 51% divorce rate still. I, when I was cleaning up some of the stuff in the basement, I found Chris and I's marriage counseling booklets. And at that time, the rate between Christians was 60%. And it's, it's actually gone down a little bit. But it's always been between 50 and 60% since 1960. We can't fight it. We can We can try. We can't fight all of it. We can't fight all of the world's wickedness. We can't fight all of the world's violence. We can't can't just go over and fight in the Middle East and take care of all those fights over there. So what do we do? Because I think for far too long, we've tried fighting it. We fought it in the wrong ways. We can look at the government and see that. But we also can't flight. We also just can't ignore it the best tool that we have as Christians here in this body right now is prayer and unity because we're not alone. We're not fighting individual fights. We're fighting together against the things that God hates, against the things that hate God to restore the relationship we once had in the Garden of Eden. That's how we fight, and that's why we fight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the sun shining. In the last 30 days, we've had 28 days of some sun. Or in the last 28 days, we've only had two days of of sun. And so we thank you for the reminder that there still is sun, that there is still light, that there is still hope. Lord, we pray that we find that hope, we find that peace that only you can provide. In a world of chaos and darkness and wickedness and violence and endless bloodshed, Lord, we reach out to you. We ask you to fight on our behalf. We ask you to give us the strength to keep fighting to keep going. 
because long as we are united together, spreading your word, speaking your gospels, then hatred can't win. Violence can't win. Satan can't win. In fact, he's already lost. We just have to turn to you and believe in that. Lord, be with us this morning. Let us realize this this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we close out, there's nothing this immediate week coming up. I don't believe, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, in two weeks, there will be the carry-in meal that is noted on, or in the bulletins. I believe that is days of 4th, 11th, 18th. So that'll be the 18th that the carry-in meal is. Um, I'm starting to toss around some ideas about spring um, and maybe having some movie get-togethers and some snacks and stuff like that for all of us, but also that might interest some of the younger crowd too. Um, so I didn't tell Chris, I didn't talk to her about that. Or she has no idea I was going to bring that up. So um, I will talk to her about that and see what she thinks. But um, I do kind of want to move into that, uh, kind of go back to our ideas of what we had before, um, trying to do something maybe once every other month. Once a month gets kind of rough, um, especially as we move into from spring into summer, uh, and that just takes off. Um, but tossing around a couple ideas in my head uh, this last week or so, and so keep an ear out for that. Uh, it's just something kind of exciting, something different, something outside of this regular gathering. So if there's ideas on that or any other thoughts on that, let me know. Uh, any other thing I'm missing or anything else that needs brought up? Cool. We will pray, and then we're dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the sun, and I thank you for the, the coolness of this morning. That reminds us sometimes we can't see the light before we go through some coldness and some darkness beforehand. Lord, thank you for the newness of, of a coming spring that we eagerly look forward to. We thank you that a, a fuzzy little animal and a groundhog was able to not see his shadow and predict an early spring, Lord. Lord, we thank you for these people here. But also, Lord, we thank you for who you are are. Lord, keep us and bless us. Lord, keep us safe and keep us healthy, but also give us strength when we feel like we can't go anymore. Give us grace when we do feel those times of hatred that aren't founded in you, that aren't a glorious cause, aren't a righteous cause, Lord. Give us the grace to grow through that and to go through that. Lord, be with us. But above all, everything else, give us humility to know it's through you that we accomplish all of this. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.